We are so excited to get started. To all of you, welcome to the National Center for the Pyramid Model Innovations Let's Talk series. This is a National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. And my, my name is Rosemary Allen, and I'm the host for this quarterly series. Each quarter, we'll be discussing current trends related to the social emotional development of young children. These webinars are designed to be interactive as well as informative, and we ask that you use your chat box to ask any questions you may have. As Lisa stated earlier, we'll make every effort to answer the questions during the presentation, but those that are not answered will be answered in our follow-up video blog, which we call Vlog. So today, we're addressing early childhood suspensions, and we have an esteemed panel that includes Dr. Kent McIntosh from the University of Oregon, Dr. Hakeem Rashid from Howard University in Washington, D.C., and Bill Jager, I'm sorry, Bill, Bill Jager from the Colorado Children's Campaign. We're really, really excited to have our panelists. So before they get started, I'd just like to go over some of the data related to preschool suspensions. Before I start, all of our webinars will start with this quote, which is one of my very favorites, and it's by James Baldwin. These are all our children. We will either pay for or profit by whatever they become, because these are all our children, and we will either profit by or pay for whatever they become. When we look at suspensions, there's no federal definition. But this definition states that it's a disciplinary action that's administered as a consequence of a child's inappropriate behavior, and it requires that the child is absent from the classroom or the learning environment for a specified period of time. For our purposes, we want to point out that we also consider suspensions as excluding a child from the overall learning process from the classroom as well as from the school premises. So this means a child is sent home early, a child is placed on a modified schedule, a child is asked to leave the program or the school because they're not considered a good fit, or a child is left in the hallway or the principal or director's office for a specified extended period of time. So let's look at what the data tells us about early childhood suspensions. In 2014, the Office of Civil Rights data report showed that 5,000 preschoolers were suspended at least once, and 2,500 a second time. In 2016, we saw the, the same patterns of racial and gender disproportionality. Boys represent about 54% of the uh, preschool population, but almost 80% of those that are suspended. And this 2016 data report also showed the same patterns of racial disproportionality that African-American preschoolers are almost four times more likely to be suspended than their white counterparts. We also saw that African-American girls are only 20% of the preschool female population, but 54% of those suspended from school. And, um, Dr. Brian Wright, he has warned us, and I just want to share this with you all, that we need to not refer to these boys and girls as male or female, because especially for black children, they lose their innocence of childhood. So we're being encouraged and challenged to remind the world that these are children. So we're going to start framing this as boys and girls rather than male or female. Several states have conducted their own um, preschool, uh, their own suspension studies for young children. And a survey in Illinois reported that 40% of the state's child care program suspended infants and toddlers. And these are children who are not yet walking, who are still in diapers, who are not talking. And in North Dakota, 20% of early childhood programs expel children. And of those that expel children, 51% were infants and toddlers. And when we look at this at Michigan, 27 per 1,000 students were suspended, and that was 34 times the state's rate for kindergarten through 
12th grade. I said earlier, there's racial disproportionality in suspensions. But we wanted to point out that this disproportionality does not only occur in suspensions, but it also occurs, occurs in how treat, children are treated in the classroom. It occurs how, in how children are disciplined, whose name is being called the most. It occurs in the referrals to the director's office or the principal's office. It also occurs in who's sent home early, who gets to stay and who's asked to leave, and who's sent to another classroom. And the 2014 and 2016 Office of Civil Rights Data Collection, it also showed us disproportionality in corporal punishment. You probably know that 19 states in our country still allow corporal punishment in public schools, and 48 states allow corporal punishment in private schools. And we see the same patterns of racial disproportionality in corporal punishment as we see in suspensions. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Why does this happen? And in order to answer that question for us, we have Dr. Kent McIntosh. Um, his webcam is not yet on, but I know that he's on speaker. So we're going to go ahead yeah. and hear. Great. Dr. Allen, thank you so much for this opportunity, and thanks to everybody uh, coming in and participating in this webinar. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a phenomenon uh, called implicit bias. And implicit bias is uh, something a little bit different than what we think of when we usually think of bias, when we think about conscious bias or overt bias. Implicit bias is a little bit different in that it's unconscious or automatic. Uh, we act on it without even thinking about it before, we've, uh, before we even know uh, that these biases are in place. Interestingly enough, they're not necessarily related to our overt biases. So we might have implicit biases that completely go against our own values as educators, as parents, as members of society. Um, we all have some level of implicit bias, and there are all sorts of different kinds. Even, even those who are affected by it uh, often have those. Just from growing up in a society where we're experiencing media representations and stereotypes uh, on a regular basis, it's very hard to grow up in society without some kinds of implicit biases to uh, guide uh, the kind of decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. And one thing that's interesting is those biases are more likely to influence specific decisions that we make. Uh, snap decisions, so decisions that we've got to make really, really quickly. And then also decisions that are ambiguous, where it's a little bit unclear which way to go. Uh, those kinds of decisions are more likely to be influenced by implicit uh, or unconscious biases. So, so um, Kent, you've talked about implicit bias. Can you tell us how this might play out in the classroom? Are you saying that teachers are biased and how they treat young children? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, uh, teachers are biased just like everybody else uh, who has biases. We all have them. And implicit biases are not always bad. We might have an implicit bias that uh, unwanted behavior is simply a child's uh, best attempt to get their needs met, in which case um, that, that might actually be really helpful. Uh, but implicit biases are harmful when they lead us, or when we're unaware of them, and they lead us uh, toward acting in ways that conflict with our values as educators in terms of uh, ameliorating the challenges that you mentioned on your previous slides. And you you often talk about um, vulnerable decision points. Can you go into that a little bit more for us? You bet. So here's a little bit of a picture of how all of this works. Um, as I was describing on the last slide, um, we all have some levels of uh, implicit biases. And uh, an older view of this um, says that those biases directly uh, predict disproportionate discipline, so those disparities in, in suspension and exclusion that you were describing before. Um, 
But a lot of research over the last 30, 40 years tells us that even though that's true, our biases aren't always in play in the decisions that we make in working with children. And so it really depends uh, sometimes on the situation. And uh, you had mentioned vulnerable decision points. So essentially, a vulnerable decision point is a specific kind of situation where our biases are more likely to lead us in ways that act out of line with our values as opposed to in line with our values. And I'll, I'll describe a couple of those that we've found in the K-12 research that we've done, and, and then we can kind of think about what that might look like in early childhood settings as well. Um, so one of the things we know is when a behavior is subjective, when it's a little bit unclear and we have to make a social judgment on that. Or if our discipline system is vague, um, meaning that we don't really have clear procedures for what to do when we see unwanted behavior uh, in our settings. Uh, in the classrooms we see in K-12, uh, that might be a little bit different uh, in early childhood settings. And then some things that we feel. Uh, we might be unfamiliar with uh, the student or something that's um, uh, affecting your decision state right in the moment, like you're hungry, you're tired, your webcam doesn't work, even though we practiced and it worked two days ago. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you talk about this multidimensional view of bias and um, vulnerable decision points, can if these if our biases are unconscious, then how do we address and reduce bias in our decision making? Oh, that's, a, that's really important for us because if we're unaware and they're snap decisions, sometimes it's very difficult for us right in the moment to see. And what we need to do is we need to look at our outcomes and see patterns that would tell us specific situations. And, and so you might look at your uh, incident report data. If you're using a data system uh, like the BRRRS, um, and uh, you might be able to see over time, or you might have a coach to look and say, hey, you know, you, in, in the middle of that situation, you made a snap decision for this student uh, or this child, but did you notice the three other children in the class that were doing the same thing? And so sometimes it's very hard for us when we're right in the middle of it. Um, but the first step is to be aware of these. And once we're aware of them, once we can predict them, then we can move forward and prevent them. So uh, the next step is talking about, so what do we do? If we can identify that there are some situations where we're more likely to have these challenges, how do we move forward with that? Um, so these four boxes here describe a chain of behavior. Sometimes we use these to describe child behavior that we want to change or unwanted behavior. Uh, but in this case, we're actually talking about, uh, say, my behavior as an aide in the classroom. So what this says is if a child is new to the program or if I'm really tired, I haven't really built a relationship with them and I'm thinking about other things, um, and a child is not following directions after requests. Let's maybe I'm saying it's a transition. Let's put away these materials and move on to the next activity. Um, well, that's a little bit subjective. And so if I'm not careful, I might make a snap decision to remove the child from that activity or remove them from the setting or send them to the uh, director's office. And uh, that child leaves the setting and gets uh, I don't have to deal with that child anymore, uh, but that's really, really um, harmful for that student and actually be harmful for my relationship uh, with that child as well. So what we do is we teach with something called a neutralizing routine, which is something that you've got ready to go, that you practice, and you can use to interrupt that implicit bias. And it looks like this. when you. When you see behavior that you think, oh, you know, I need to step in and correct this right away, you know, ask yourself, you know, based on either the information or based on my reflection and some of the uh, thinking tools that we use, is this one of those situations where I might not line up, uh, where my behavior might not line up with my values? And so instead of my snap decision response, I'm going to train myself to use an alternative response. In this case, I'm going to stop myself. I'm going to take a few deep breaths, 
and then I'm going to restate the direction. I'm going to reteach it in a different way. So maybe that means I move in uh, and get at eye level with the students and sort of move to the side and kind of coach uh, with them as opposed to kind of stand over them and wag my finger that I've been doing. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop that chain of behavior happening and keep that child in instruction as much as possible. Wonderful. So um, we have a lot of classroom teachers on the webinar right now, and, and sometimes it's very difficult for them to identify a vulnerable decision point when so much is happening in the classroom. And some may feel that a snap decision is required. But Kent, I'm hearing you say that even during those high-stress moments that we can take a moment and we can implement this type of alternative response. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that response might look like? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we know, and this is research that's not necessarily in education, um, but it tells us that these neutralizing routines could be almost anything as long as they're brief and as long as they slow down our decision making so we can really think and, and respond in a different way. Uh, and I'm going to share with you an example of what we might call a neutralizing routine that you might be familiar with with teaching children in your program. And uh, it's called the turtle technique. And so we actually teach children this, that when we get upset, first we've got to recognize it, then we've got to think, okay, I've got to stop right now, right? Slow down the decision making, go into my shell, take three deep breaths and then come out when you're ready to make a, a solution. It's not hard for us to teach this to children, but one of the things that we run into is that children are really good at stating it when they're calm and ready to go um, and when they're being prompted to do it, but sometimes they won't use it in um, regular interactions with each other. They only do it during the lesson. And so one of the things that's important is if this works for children and we want them to do it, the best way for us to get them to use it is actually to model it for, our, for, for them, so model it ourselves for the children. And so what that means is I really explicitly say, I'm going to use my turtle technique and walk through the four steps, and that kind of gives the children the permission to do that themselves. It's a little prompt for them, but the thing that's great is it also helps us out at the same time. That is amazing. And you know, so many times, we teach children these techniques, and we don't think about how we can actually model the te techniques for the children. Um, can you just tell me briefly what role critical reflection might play in reducing implicit bias? Absolutely. The two ways that we've found, or actually there are three ways that we've found to identify these vulnerable decision points. One is to look at national uh, data and see where there are big patterns. Sometimes you would look at school data uh, or program data to say, oh, yeah, you know, we're seeing more disproportionality. So more of our uh, black and brown children are getting incident reports written for them in unstructured time uh, at, at a, a playground or in, in unstructured center time or, or something like that. That's one way of doing it. But we also all have these little uh, hot button triggers that we have for ourselves, and each one is individualized for us. Uh, and so being able to, A, look at your program data, but B, also be able to reflect and say, yeah, when, I've been the, when, when was a time when I really didn't act in line with my values and I sort of responded uh, with anger and exclusion instead of calm reteaching that we know that our children need? And that kind of reflection is really helpful for us to find our personal vulnerable decision points, not just the ones uh, that are just broad for our program or our district or our region. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kent, and we appreciate that. I just want to remind our participants that the chat box is open. If you have any questions, please type them right there in our box. You know, when we think about the discipline gap, we also have to think about how it impacts the so-called achievement or opportunity gap. And as we consider that, we have to know that students, children, boys and girls, don't learn if they are not in school. And when we look at the data around these gaps, we see our data tells us that it's black boys who are faring worse in our schools. 
So Dr. Hakeem Rashid is going to talk about the plight of black boys in the American educational system. Dr. Rashid? Thank you, Dr. Allen. Um, I pre certainly appreciate the discussion on suspensions, but I think the dialogue around uh, suspension has to be put in a much broader context. Uh, we have to deal with a, uh, a historical context. And as I say in the slide here, a historical, cultural, and political uh, context. We, are quite, we often ask, uh, why are these children, these children of African descent, having such major problems? But I think that's the wrong question. We're in a system of education, a system of early childhood education that is rooted in what I think is one of the fundamental American values, and that's racism. Now, unfortunately, we don't want to look at racism as, as an American value, but this country, you know, was founded on not only the enslavement of people of African descent, but the actual taking away of the land and ultimately the, the culture of Native Americans. So the educational system, any educational system is a reflection of the culture that produces it. And I don't think we're in, the, uh, in any kind of uh, different situation here. Um, young boys come into the early childhood education system uh, as potential young black men. Uh, if, they, if they're fortunate enough to grow up, they will become young black men. And young black men have been seen within this cultural context as a threat uh, for, really from their arrival. Uh, so what we see happening in the educational system is just a reflection of what has happened uh, throughout the culture, the cultural context of America, over the last nearly 400 uh, years. Now, this plays itself out in terms of how little children are treated, not only in preschool, but also K-12 classrooms in terms of lower expectations, in terms of differential behavior. There's a whole litany of, of, of things that happen to young black children as they matriculate through the American educational system. But we can't you know, we can't be in denial. Uh, uh, our, whole, our whole notion of uh, implicit bias, you know, there has to be a recognition that, that uh, uh, you know, implicit bias is a cultural phenomenon, and it's more than implicit. It has its explicit uh, dimension also. You know, Dr. Rashid, you have an amazing article called From Brilliant um, Baby to Child Placed at Risk. And you talk about how our African-American children, particularly our boys, they enter into our child care facilities, into our centers for early learning, bright-eyed and curious and brilliant. And by the time they leave, they are often children placed at risk. And can you tell us how that happens, especially as it's related to the perceptions that teachers have of black males? Well, um Again, if you look at the fact that the uh, majority of, of teachers in America are white females, majority of teachers are female, so you have this gender dynamic uh, at work, and you also have the racial uh, dynamic at work. I make reference to um, Neil's study in 2003 that talked about Caucasian teachers having negative perceptions of the movement style of black males. Well, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we know that the behavior of black boys has been in the same kind of behavior may, may receive a differential uh, punishment. Uh, we know that uh, 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 there are many teachers who have internalized this negative view of black men, and ultimately it plays itself out in the classroom. But I just want to say that this is not just uh, an issue here in the United States. Uh, and we have to start looking at this intersectionality between uh, race and gender and what goes on in early childhood education. I was just looking at a report this morning out of Jamaica that talked about how young, how young boys are, are uh, 
rate is having more behavior problems and more problems in their in the early academic arena. So it's not just within the, the racial context here in America. We've got to look, look at some serious gender issues, I think, going on uh, globally. And this, you know, leads us to, you know, this whole need for uh, recruiting more men, black men, into the field of early childhood education. And that's a topic for us, another webinar. Um, but also the need to, to uh, revamp our professional development uh, uh, processes. Uh, we've got to begin to address this whole issue of uh, racism in the classroom. We have to hit it head on. Uh, we, we can't tiptoe around the edges and act like it really uh, uh, doesn't uh, exist. Right. You know, um, Dr. Rashid, you just reminded me of Goff's study that talked about how black children are criminalized and most often thought to be older, sometimes by four and a half years, and how they don't have the protections of childhood and they are not considered as innocent. And as you, I think about that study and thinking about how um, many white teachers have negative perceptions of the movement styles of black males. It brings me to think about culturally responsive practices and how we can make sure that we're tying into the cultural ways of being of all children of color. Can you talk a little bit about what that might look like in a classroom? Well, I think uh, culturally responsive practices, uh, first of all, they will begin with a, a wholesale change in attitude. But ultimately, uh, teachers are going to have to try to identify what the strengths of children are, what the interests of children are, and build on those strengths and interests. Uh, quite often, uh, education is a top-down phenomenon. Uh, Paulo Freire in the Pedagogy of the Press calls it the banking process, depositing knowledge and then pulling it out at test time. At test time when we re really need a more dialogical kind of approach going in and saying, well, okay, what is it that these children are interested in doing? And what you'll find is that when children are doing things that they're interested in, they persist, they, you, your, your uh, 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 discipline problems go down, uh, achievement levels go up. Uh, if you look at uh, African-American children in cooperative learning contexts, for example, uh, they, they, they learn better, they persist at a greater rate, um, but again, we're boxed in. We're boxed in by, um, you know, I guess I would call it uh, uh, a system that, you know, dictates the teachers what they must do. And it's, it's very difficult for teachers to get out of that, uh, that box and give children what they need. Absolutely. You know, I was just thinking again about Neil's study about white teachers having negative perceptions of the way that black males move. And um, Dr. McIntosh, I was reminded of your story identifying a vulnerable decision point on the school playground when children were playing basketball. Do you mind sharing that and making that connection to this study around the movement styles of black males? Oh, absolutely. So. Um this was a school that I was working with, and they looked at their school data. Um, inner city school, significant disproportionality for um, African American boys, and particularly African American boys with disabilities. And they, they started drilling down and looking specifically at those patterns, and they found that uh, the vast majority of the disproportionality was for physical aggression on the playground. And when they looked um, uh, and talked with recess supervisors and looked a little bit more closely, they were finding a lot of it was related to um, difference in perceived rules on the basketball court. And so some students were playing uh, what you might call street ball rules, which is a little bit more physical, a little bit more in your face, maybe a little bit more um, uh, active conversations about people's skills. Uh, and a lot of other students and the supervisors were kind of playing National Basketball Association rules. No, uh, no smack talk, no playing defense, and so on. And so they had this situation where they could choose either um, to view the behavior of the black boys as wrong and, uh, and, and you know, a terrible uh, 
a menace to society, or they could say, you know what, actually the way they're playing is perfectly appropriate for the community court that's two blocks away. And because we've got so many students, what they decided to do, and you could do this a few different ways, but they decided, you know what, we'll teach what NBA rules are, and we're going to clarify that uh, street ball is not wrong, but here's how we're going to play it here. And that difference between labeling behavior as wrong versus not for school or not for this area is a huge difference there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ken. And, and, and as we can see that that movement style can be perceived as aggressive. Hey, you're on, Ken. And it can be- <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> and, and Dr. Rashid, you, you talk about from boys to men in the African-American community. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, again, uh, uh, just to kind of piggyback on what Kent said, uh, it, it reminds me of a, uh, an incident that my oldest grandchild had when a white basketball coach thought he was about four years older than he actually was based on his skill level on the basketball court in this particular private school context. Now, what that did is set him up uh, for a lot of different possibly negative things in the sense that he was about 10 at the time, and the coach thought he was about 14. Well, you're going to have a different kind of uh, uh, interaction and expectation. Um, I have seven grandsons right now, and, all, you know, ranging in age from 1 to 14, and, you know, uh, their parents, grandparents, uh, myself, we're all in the process now of trying to make sure that they can negotiate this period of time, uh, uh, you know, prior to adulthood and go from boys to men, uh, productive men, men who have not uh, been incarcerated, men who have not been marginalized by society, and, uh, you know, trying to make all the kinds of decisions that, that need to go into that process. Uh, this is something that, that large numbers of African-American men have to deal with every day. And it's a process uh, that I, I, I use this quote from Oscar Barberin. Uh, it, he says it has the elements of a classic tragedy. And this is a tragedy that begins in the preschool years. If we're talking about disproportionate suspension rates, we're certainly talking about uh, different uh, kinds of behaviors that the children are exposed to. And if they're, if they're not reading at grade level by third grade, and we know that there are a lot that goes into that kindergarten through third grade uh, uh, period in terms of the, the impact of, uh, of uh, teacher relationships, uh, whether or not uh, teachers see them in a positive light. Uh, and we know that there's a, a, I don't know if it's an urban myth or what, that third grade reading scores are being used to predict the number of prison beds 10 years down the line. Even if it's not true, it looks as if it's true, because uh, what ends up happening is that our young boys go through the, the uh, elementary school years, they go through the middle school years. We know they're not graduating uh, uh, at the same rate as their peers, and ultimately they find themselves uh, involved with the criminal uh, justice system, and we see this whole cycle uh, reinforcing itself. So it's important for us in early childhood education to get involved in that pre-K through third grade period to make sure that literacy levels are where they need to be, to make sure that teachers understand that children are children. They need to be treated as children, but within the cultural context that they're being raised in. So, you know, uh, um, I remember uh, many years ago I wrote an ar ar article uh, looking at early childhood education as a cultural transition for African-American children, um, the, making that transition from the culture of the home to the culture of the school. And this plays itself out in terms of, of uh, not only athletics, but uh, the whole issue of language. You know, what kind of language are the children going to use in the school? Uh, you know, I've, I've been in favor for a long time of, of 
treating standard English as a foreign language for ch for children of African descent in America and teaching it to them as such, because I think that uh, in the end we'll end up with with bilingual, bidialectical uh, uh, children. Absolutely, um, Dr. Rashid. I know that you are involved in the Perry Preschool Program, and it's it's when we look at the outcome for children who participated in that program, it, it, we, we use that data. We use the data to really promote high quality early childhood programs while at the same time, these young children are being suspended and expelled and pushed out the back door through suspensions and through expulsions. Um, and I know you're gonna talk about patterns of achievement for young African-American boys as they transition to kindergarten, but what happened that we have not realized the promise? of the Perry's preschool program? Well, for one thing, um, you know, and this may not be the right setting to say this, but we've got to kind of deal with the myth and the reality of the Perry preschool study. It was a great study. It was the, the gold standard in terms of, you know, comparing a, a group that went to preschool with a group that did not go to preschool who came from the same basic uh, uh, neighborhood context. But the... The Perry Preschool Study, the Perry Preschool Project, uh, and I don't think any preschool project can really be the be-all to end-all of our uh, approach to, to uh, education and to, uh, uh, you know, trying to close the, the gaps and, and promote educational excellence. Let me give you one example. Within the context of the Perry Preschool Study, the, at the end of the eighth grade, the children who went to preschool were found to read at a, a full grade level ahead of those who didn't go to preschool. Now, that sounds impressive on its face. But when you really dig into the data, what you find is that the kids who went to preschool were reading at a fifth grade level, and the kids who didn't go to preschool were reading at a fourth grade level. Now, mm -hmm. We can look at all the different life outcome differences. Uh, the kids who went to preschool were paying more taxes. The kids who went to preschool had a higher uh, employment rate. They were more likely to graduate from college, more likely to go to high school. But these are, these are st statistical uh, uh, differences. At some point, we've got to raise the question of, of uh, you know, we may have significant differences in terms of results, but are they really significant and meaningful in terms of uh, overall outcomes? Now, that would not, I would not deny the value of high-quality early childhood education programs, and I think that they, we need to implement them across the board, but we, just, we need to do a lot more. Uh, we definitely need to do a lot more to make sure that children when they go through that preschool period, that they come out and, and they, they, uh, uh, they're able to survive and thrive in the uh, early elementary years. And that's why I wanted to share this, um, this slide in terms of patterns of achievement for young African-American boys, because I think it's important that we, we recognize that young African-American boys are not monolithic in terms of what happens to them. We see a lot of different kinds of things going on as they are emerging from those preschool years. And, and uh, Aruka and, and her associates came up with these four patterns, uh, you know, based on their research. And I think that, again, our challenge is to say, well, okay, what can we do to, to make sure that teachers do what, whatever they can to increase the number of children that are increasing academically as they move beyond the uh, – uh, the uh, preschool years into the kindergarten years. Um, you know, we've got a lot of research out there that talks about, you know, children uh, having a, a hard time making that transition, and a lot of it has to do with the kind of uh, teaching practices that they're exposed to as they move into kindergarten. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Rashid, for this amazing information. I see that Maria Shields and Elizabeth have a question. And Maria, we 
know that there are some behaviors that are persistent and ongoing and resistant to a lot of the challenges that we're talking about. And the key to that is implementing a behavioral management system that prevents and addresses challenging behaviors. And we know, and the research tells us, that the pyramid model has been very successful in addressing some of those persistent, ongoing behaviors. When you talk about when enough is enough, that's a question that many early childhood educators are asking. But what we know implicitly, explicitly, is that children who are asked to leave rarely get the help that they need. And um, Bill and I talk a lot about this as we talk about it's like kicking a can down the road. And what we have to do is address the issues that are occurring in the classroom, in the classroom setting. And that leads us into some of the efforts that are happening nationally to reduce and ultimately eliminate suspensions in early childhood programs. But one of the things that we know is that in order to eliminate preschool suspensions, early childhood suspensions, we have to give the teachers the support and the tools that they need in order to really prevent and address challenging behaviors from occurring. And when I say challenging behavior, that's the behaviors of the children, but also the behaviors of the adults that are engaging in some of the implicit bias that Dr. McIntosh talked about. So Bill, can you tell us what's happening around the country in terms of policy to reduce suspensions and expulsions? Great, thanks Dr. Allen. Thanks for um, inviting me to participate. Our organization works on state policy pieces but tracks a lot of what's happening in other states around these issues. And I thought it might be helpful to just give a highlight of some policies that have been on the books mostly added in the last four or five years uh, around the issue of early suspensions and expulsions in several states. Um, some of these deal more with the public school side than the community-based child care provider side, uh, but some of these states have mixed delivery systems where these policies spill over into that community-based site as well. And they kind of fall into two buckets, sort of there have been policy efforts at states to try to define the grounds under which it's appropriate to remove children from school uh, that might look different for a young child than a 16, 17, 18 year old. And others that have come at this from the issue of promoting alternatives, uh, looking at what can states do, what can uh, state policy and public investments do to support educators in implementing approaches that don't remove children from school. And so when we look at the states that take in a tap of how do we set different grounds, there have been different models. So New Jersey, Connecticut, Oregon, they have, again, as you can see, varying by age level, uh, different types of restrictions on the ground. And I'd say a common theme is that they tend to focus on uh, uh, restrictions with exceptions for instances where there's a physical endangerment of others. In those instances, there's a, a usually grounds that children can be removed from the school. Uh, we know that there's bias and still on how that's interpreted, of course, of what is endangerment. So some are more specific than others in saying that there's been harm or threat of harm. Uh, and then others have sort of tried to push these decisions more to kind of school district level. Uh, some of the things that Dr. McIntosh was hiring at, uh, highlighting at the school site level where individuals are reviewing data or looking at practices or seeing when are the instances uh, when children are, are being identified as uh, causing disruptions or being removed from school. Uh, Rhode Island has taken an approach to look at a superintendent review of do we have unequal impact in our disciplinary policies, and that's mandated in statute. On the promoting alternative side, um, it's really oftentimes focused on how do we get dollars into the hands of uh, schools and providers so that they can implement, implement alternatives. Uh, a heavy emphasis in the statutes around the state around restorative practices and promoting alternative approaches, uh, school climate sort of investments. Uh, and then Louisiana, for example, wanting an evaluation of what was highlighted in the question um, uh, as well around evaluation of positive behavioral interventions to try to spread, spread those practices uh, more widely. So that gives you a sense of uh, those pieces. I did also want to highlight a few areas um, uh, where we could uh, uh, really look at uh, the state policy action that has happened within the last year. And again, in these two buckets, restricting 
and then promoting alternatives. 18 states had legislation really looking at this issue of exclusionary discipline, so it really speaks to there's no geographic clustering here. As you look at the, the map, you can see across the country. Um, notable, though, that only five states enacted legislation, 34 total pieces of legislation, only nine bills passed. But I would say if you're looking for legislation that's moved the furthest in really setting uh, developmentally uh, specific grounds for when children are allowed to be removed in this age group, Maryland, Arkansas, and Texas uh, have very interest, uh, interesting legislation focused on significantly reducing the grounds for the removal of young children. Uh, Rosemary, I'm just keeping an eye on time here, so I'm just going to get through these last two slides so that you can uh, uh, do some wrap-up and questions. So I uh, just wanted to also highlight that um, we also have legislation promoting alternatives. So 12 states and Washington, D.C. proposed legislation, three enacted and four total bills passed, and then notably again, Maryland, Virginia, and our state of Colorado looking at strategies to promote alternatives or requiring some analysis and sharing of best practices. Uh, I would just finally conclude with a few points that the federal debate has been ramping up around the issue of early suspension and expulsion. Uh, when the Office for Civil Rights under President Obama issued some findings around disproportionate impact, and some regulatory guidance uh, that prompted uh, local action. In many ways, though, uh, the current administration is rethinking that. And in many ways, the conversation we're having nationally about school safety is starting to put a target on some of the guidance and policies that have tried to keep children in school. And so I think that's something where this uh, debate over school safety is being pitted against inclusive practices in a way that's rather unfortunate. Uh, also, a lot of local action on this, Washington, D.C., Denver, Houston, have taken these issues on locally. And in the 2018 legislative session, many states are, are tackling it as well. So I'll conclude there, Rosemary, see what other questions you might have. You know, Bill, I was thinking about um, the whole idea that teachers need tools. And I know that some of the opposition for um, against banning suspension is, is that we're taking a tool out of the toolbox. But one of our leaders here um, very eloquently said that suspensions are not a tool, they're actually a weapon. Can you tell us um, some of the supports that teachers need as you look at legislation? What are some of the supports that have been put in place um, to help teachers to address some of the behaviors that they find challenging in the classroom? Yeah. I think this is an, uh, a place where um, actually public policy can be the wrong lever. I think public policy should be in the business of promoting alternatives, providing the resources, but letting the local community and the local practitioners decide based on evidence and based on community need what would work best. And so we have evidence-based practices around restorative approaches that uh, help children understand how behavior affects others, builds community. Uh, we have approaches that help educators understand as Dr. McIntosh hired, uh, highlighted, uh, uh, implicit biases and the ways they play out in practice. So I think getting resources to support those sort of um, promotion of alternative approaches is effective in public policy. I think states can get it wrong when they think uh, one size fits all in terms of this is the approach that the whole state needs instead of applying resources and saying use evidence locally. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of you, and at this point, we only have a few minutes left, is to open it up to questions. And one of the questions that Elizabeth has, um, Kent, is there any research that's been conducted on the neutralizing, on neutralizing routines? Great question. So I, I tried to respond in the Q&A box, and I don't know if it came through. Uh, but we've got a couple studies uh, that have been shown in the K-12 uh, area. So some of the, the work that I described, um, the scenario with the uh, basketball court, it's also another one Clay Cook and colleagues have uh, done teaching um, uh, classroom teachers about um, uh, neutralizing routine to use in their classrooms. Uh, that's been shown to be effective. And then we, you, as you know, you and I have been doing uh, training with uh, our two programs in the Pyramid Equity Project. Uh, and uh, so far that was, uh, seemed very well received. People were uh, excited to use it. And, and that plus is a combination of using the pyramid approach, 
these programs have uh, reduced their suspensions to zero. Hopefully we'll see. We'll, we'll make sure to uh, get uh, information out about those that will go through the uh, PMI website, I'm sure. Okay. Um, another question from Elizabeth is, can you talk a little bit more about what PEP is? Sure. Why don't, why don't I take that on while uh, Rosemary is talking? So the Pyramid Equity Project is a small pilot project that has been funded by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP, uh, and that was to uh, roll out a comprehensive approach to uh, reducing exclusionary discipline, uh, especially for students of color, but also students from um, other underrepresented groups, um, and with the idea that we have a lot of good ideas out there, but how much proof do we have to put it all into one package? Uh, and so that project includes uh, training in the pyramid model. It includes coaching just as, as you would, but also special attention to uh, ensuring that the practices that are implemented are culturally responsive, uh, that educators uh, receive uh, training and support in identifying their implicit biases, uh, and support in neutralizing routines, and also uh, using those incident data for decision making to monitor, um, to identify any um, disparities, identify vulnerable decision points, and then um, with the leadership team take steps to, to move that into action. Um, so you'll see a number of resources that will come out. That project is not quite uh, complete, uh, but a few resources that will come out and guide uh, in for schools either using the pyramid model, uh, I'm sorry, programs either using the pyramid model or not using the pyramid model could use to um, increase equity in early childhood education. Bill, would you like to give us a few parties? Uh, just a question to uh, uh, practitioners and uh, thinkers around these issues uh, engaging on this topic. I think it is uh, timely and vital, but is also an entry to a, a dialogue about many other ways we get uh, the support, the training, the resources into the early care and education field. And if this is a lever towards that end, um, uh, let's pursue it. So as we begin to wrap up, I just want to remind our um, participants that you are all superheroes that you get to touch the lives of this country's youngest citizens. You can breathe life into every child with whom you come in contact. So let's manage our behaviors, give the kids the tools to regulate theirs, and let's create a classroom of superheroes. Thank you so much for your participation on this first Let's Talk webinar.